Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank all of you for joining us today. I'm Roy Williams. I'm president and CEO of the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber, and we're really glad you could join us today for a discussion on the impact of a new jail and what it will have mean to our city. Uh, but before we learn more about that topic, I'd like to recognize our presenting sponsor, Cox Business. Please help me welcome Nikki Halffield, sales manager with Cox Business, to offer some comments. Nikki? Oh, hello, everyone. Oh, I'm just going to move this down a little bit. <laughs> So thank you guys for having us. Uh, I know we're here a lot. Um, I moved here in April from Northwest Arkansas. Not new to Cox, but new to Oklahoma City. Love it. <laughs> I'm glad I made it here, because today, as I was telling some of my colleagues, that today was the first time I drove here by myself. So <laughs> thank you, Jesus, for getting me here. <laughs> no, but um, my colleagues thought it would be appropriate for me to speak today, because I actually have a little bit of law enforcement background. <laughs> so, My uh, father was a police officer in Charlotte, North Carolina. And my husband is recently a police officer, I'm sorry, recently retired police officer uh, from Florida and Arkansas both. So anyway, near and dear to my heart. <laughs> I love Cox as a company because we're, they're a great supporter. Um, they love growing businesses. They love growing cities. Um, and large supporters. So from us to you, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, as well. But uh, enjoy your lunch, and thank you again. Well, thank you, Nikki. Um, I'm also pleased to recognize our corporate sponsor, ADG, which you see up here. So thank you both for your support of the work of the chamber. Uh, <clears throat> As all of you know, the challenges and the issues with our current jail facility are quite publicly known. Uh, you've he heard and read a lot about it. And following the, the Department of Justice report on the hazardous conditions of the facility, um, our organization, the Chamber, really dove into the work of criminal justice reform alongside law enforcement, public officials, and community leaders to really address a long list of items, and that began about six years ago. So significant improvements have been made to the jail to make it safer, but there is really no way to solve the real fundamental problems that make that building very, very inefficient. So on June the 28th, residents of Oklahoma County will have the opportunity to vote on a $260 million bond issue that will fund the construction of a new jail. A new jail is not only important for the future of our city and county's public safety, but also to the continued work on criminal justice reform for our community. So with our three panelists today, we're gonna to discuss more about the upcoming vote, um, the latest updates on the current facility, and the advantages that a new facility will provide our community. But before we begin that discussion, we're gonna take a short break for lunch. So enjoy your meal and enjoy your company at your table and we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Please continue your lunch or your dessert. Uh, as we bring uh, the panelists up to the stage, uh, their complete biographies are in your digital program. So. Please help me welcome, first of all, Carrie Bloomert, Oklahoma County Commissioner, District 1. Welcome. Jim Couch, Jail Trust Chair of the Oklahoma County Criminal Justice Authority. And Tommy Johnson III, our Oklahoma County Sheriff. So Commissioner, we're going to start with you. Um, you and two other Oklahoma County Commissioners approved to send the $260 million bond issue uh, to the vote of the people on June 28th, uh, which is the next step, obviously, in building a new Oklahoma County Jail. 
why is now the right time to do this? Hello, can everyone hear me? Okay, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I wanna make sure everyone can hear me. So why is now the right time? Is that the question? Right. Why is now the right time? So we finally have three county commissioners who can actually agree to do something about this issue. <laughs> and, and the three of us are very different. We all care about different issues and we're from different parties, but we agree that it is finally time to do something. And we have the business community behind us. We have our judges and everyone in the courthouse behind us. Um, we have the public support. We have our nonprofit community in support. So it is, it is really the right time where all the right pieces are coming together and we can actually do something about this. Right, thank you, Carrie. Uh, Jim, so if we build this facility, what are the advantages of the new facility and what features would be included in it that currently we don't have? Before I get to that, can I add a couple more points sure. to, to, to the petitioner's points? One is be, we, it's the right time because of the criminal justice work that's been done over the last several years that you've been involved with, Roy. And we've been able to do things that have uh, lowered the, the population of the jail from 2,600 to 15 something as of this week. So we, we've done a lot of positive things in the field of criminal justice. But the second thing is that there's an opportunity out there, uh, along with everything Commissioner Bloomer said, because of the fact that there are expiring bonds at the county. And with those expiring bonds, we're able to pass a bond issue to get quite a bit of capital towards this end uh, without raising taxes. And that hasn't always been out there. So everything she said is, is, is right, but beyond that, there's a couple of other key points. So why, what's, what will the new building have that this building doesn't have? Right. You know, this building was built uh, almost 30 years ago now. It's, it's getting there. It was designed at least 30 years ago. And uh, a multi-story jail was kind of in vogue at that point in time. This wasn't the only place in the country that has a multi-story jail. They became out of vogue shortly thereafter because of the <laughs> operational <laughs> issues out of vogue. associated with it. The multi-story is a real problem, and we're trying to, to move the, the number of, of detainees that we need to move every day over to court and get them up and down the, the, the uh, elevators at the same time we're trying to serve meals and, and do medical work with, 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 the, with the detainees. It's a real challenge. It's, it, it is a problem. The facility was never designed with medical facilities. Well, most of our detainees have some type of medical issues. Not all of our detainees have taken really good care of themselves over the years. And so because of that, it's a big part of what we do. And this shale doesn't, it wasn't designed with, with medical facilities. So we've taken a pod up on the top floor and converted into medical facilities, and it's really not adequate for what we need to do. It has no mental health uh, facilities in it. Now again, we've taken a pod and, and, and tried to do some things in there, but really, really not designed for that. There's no recreational areas. There's a recreation area on the roof, but once again, you're getting, getting everybody up there to, to do that. It's, it's, it's not really used. Recreation is, is a big problem there. Sight lines, when we do our sight checks, sight lines in the cells are, are a problem. There's nothing that you can really easily correct. There are cinder block walls unreinforced between the individual cells. Well, with a little time and a, and a detainee that has a little time on their hands, they can, they can chip away and break through that. And so it, it happens. I mean, we, we correct it, and we fill them in, and we fix it, but you know, every, it, it, it happens. And so when the health department comes in, they'll find one or two of those. Mm -hmm. it, has, um, it has grid ceilings, you know, with the metal grids, with the, and those are easy to, to uh, knock those out and, and destroy them or break them. I mean, you can, a, a detainee can throw something up there and break it. And again, every time those are broken, I mean, we can have everyone replaced on, on, on Monday and the Department of Health comes in on, on Wednesday and they'll find seven or eight that are broken. It's just, it's just, it's just because of the design of the building, it, it, it's a problem area. It doesn't have the space we need to provide services for the detainees, which is really important. And the thought process when this was designed, uh, I guess in the late 80s, the built in the 90s, uh, is different from what it is today. There's much more desire to get services in to, to, to deal with the issues that the detainees are having to make sure we can rectify their underlying issues to make sure we can, we can get them back out, out of, out of the, the, the correctional system and make them successful in life. 
So there's a lot of reasons out there that this building uh, is no longer adequate for our needs. Can I add one thing? Sure. So I'm going to make my mental health folks happy by talking about this. So in the current building, there are no anti-ligature things built into to the design. Anti-ligature basically means that you cannot use the door handle, something in the ceiling to hurt yourself or to try to take your own life. So you've seen over the years, folks have used things throughout the facility to take their own life because anti-ligature was not included in the design. Um, when you go to any mental health facility, any detention center that was built after, you will see that there are anti-ligature things included. So that's something very important, life-saving, that will be included in the new facility. Thanks. As a follow-up to, to both of you, the bond issue proposed is $260 million. The estimated sort of cost of what they're saying that jail will be is about $300 million. So there's a gap of about 40 million. What, what do y'all, how do you describe how that gap would be filled? <laughs> okay, well, I'm curious to hear Jim's answer. Well, there, that, there, are, there are three opportunities that are out there. One would be uh, to do a revenue anticipation note uh, based upon the, the cost savings of the new facility. So the new facility, it's, it's more energy efficient. It, it, it may, you know, it, it's gonna be easier to, to, to to uh, administer and run and, we'll, uh, and, and such. So there's anticipated to be some operational savings. You can uh, issue what's called revenue anticipation notes and, and, and bring in some money to fill that gap. That's one possibility. The county commissioners could pass um, a, a uh, basically a lease buyback where they would issue some bonds, revenue bonds to fill that. Of course, there would be an annual payment on that and that could fill part of the gap to do that. And then lastly, we're still pursuing the opportunity for ARPA money. And there was some thought that, oh gosh, the county has 150 some million dollars of ARPA nut money and that, that, that's gonna be our answer. Well, the restrictions on ARPA money are, are, are pretty restrictive. And so we can't use it for very many purposes, but I think there's still an opportunity maybe to use some of that ARPA money to fill in for some very specific parts of the jail. And I'll, I'll add, I get asked quite a bit why are we going out for $260 million in bonds when we know the facility is going to cost more than that? So that $260 million is what we could get without raising your property taxes. And that, was, that is obviously very enticing to voters um, to vote for something that does not raise your taxes but still helps accomplish the goal. Uh, so that gap, the commissioners and the trust are going to have to work together to figure out how to fill that gap um, everything uh, Chairman Couch mentioned are things we're considering, um, but we have not made any decisions yet. There's also, uh, as part of, in addition to the ARPA, the ARPA um, money that, that the county received, there's also um, about $10 million that you can, um, and I'm missing my words here, um, the county can basically receive an extra $10 million uh, in uh, anticipated loss of revenue due to the pandemic. And that $10 million do not, does not have the restrictions that the original ARPA money has. So there's some, there's some opportunities to kind of braid funding to figure out this last piece. Yeah. So as a follow-up to you, Commissioner, uh, the day the commissioners voted to take this to the public, y'all also passed a resolution about engaging citizen oversight. Could you talk a little bit about that and why that's yes. important? So everyone in here should be familiar with maps um, and the success of maps one, two, three, and you're seeing the success of maps four. Every iteration of maps has included a citizens advisory board and involving the citizens in such a um, dedicated way and such a, a very purposeful way has been successful to keep those that program as public and as transparent as possible. So we were encouraged to take a note from MAPS and create a citizens advisory board with building this new facility. And we also have a citizens advisory board that works with our jail trust. Um, I believe the sheriff has his own citizens advisory board. So we are certainly aware that 30 years ago, the input of citizens was almost nil. Um, the commissioners and the powers that be at the time made a lot of decisions behind closed doors. And that's what got us to where we are today. And we know that we cannot repeat that mistake. 
And so the commissioners all three agreed that we needed to include the public in this process as much as possible. Good, thank you. So I haven't forgotten about you, Sheriff. It's <laughs> <laughs> going crazy. So it's, it's pretty much been understood that uh, renovating the existing facility is really not feasible mm -hmm. and would be a really drawn out expensive process. So as you're out there, what do you hear about uh, the public's attitude toward building a new jail and, and sort of what's the level of, of support that you might be hearing? I mean, the level of support is very high. Uh, I will tell you, this is the one thing that I think, regardless of the aisle, regardless of the side of the aisle you sit on, everyone can come together and say, we need to fix this issue. We need to fix this issue. And I think that is beautiful when we recognize this is bigger than us individually. This is bigger than, than, than my office. This is bigger than everything. We have to take care of our people in the jail. And I think this provides a level of safety that we don't have right now. Um, I think this keeps our community safe. I think this keeps our DOs and our inmates safe. Um, I think this is a beautiful way to marriage our diversionary programs and our mental health programs to come into the jail so we can be tough on crime, but still give people the help they need to be successful when they get out. Because some people we can invest in and they can do better than, which, than when they went in. And I just think this is a beautiful marriage that everyone supports and, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you, Sheriff. Jim, um, no matter what you propose to the public, you never get 100% agreement that you know, we're doing the right thing. So relative to the jail, how do you respond to the people who say this is not the best solution, that there should be something else? How do you respond to that? Well, first of all, I, I would ask them, have you been to the jail? <laughs> Um, because if you have, I, I, I don't know how many people would really ask that question. The fact of the matter is, I, I, I actually thought that, that some type of renovation of the jail would be, would, would be the way to go when we started this process. And I've been very, uh, very much talked out of that solution, that that is not the recommendations. There are too many structural inherent problems into that facility that, that we can fix it. You could do some things to improve it, but you can never really get to where you want to go and the, the difference in the, in the price, it's a, you know, it, it, it really needs to be a new facility at this point in time. Um, Commissioner Mon was quoted as saying that there, you know, there is no second, second option, and, and I really agree with him. I mean, you, 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 if, you, if you can't remodel it and you can't live with what you've got, you've really got to build a new facility. All right. Thanks. Uh, so, Sheriff, in thinking about this facility, how, how will this new facility impact not only the safety of the people who are in it, but the public at large and also those who work in it? Okay, so when we talk about right now, this is a maximum security facility for everyone. What's the incentive to be good in jail? We're all locked down. There's no graduated sanctions or progressive discipline that can happen. Oftentimes we have people in there that are low level offenders that are in the same pod as a high level offender. And this new jail will allow us to have tiers, minimum, medium, and maximum security holding facilities so we can really separate people, keep people safe. Um, and, and I think when you look at bringing it from a 13 story down to one level, you talk about the employees and how labor intensive it is to operate this current facility. I mean, just navigating the elevator system. What happens when you pass meds or, you know, push meals? Or, Lord forbid, a, an attorney come to see their client. You know, how long do they have to wait? Their days are busy as well. And so I think this new facility makes it safe, makes it better, uh, a better facility to operate in. and. Um, I just, I just think it helps all the way around. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Jim, uh, uh, back to a question on the trust. Um, you know, we're going to have to live with this jail for a couple years, obviously. Mm -hmm. And it does have its problems. So tell us a little bit about what the trust is focused on in, in this and plans to focus on while this interim time period elapses. Well, first of all, when, when the trust took over the jail, almost two years ago now, the operations of it before Sheriff Johnson's time, uh, it was in, in bad shape and, and it had not had proper dollars put into it for whatever reason. Um, we were able to get some CARES Act dollars and with those CARES Act dollars, we were able to put in uh, water pumps so we get water 
to, to every cell. We couldn't get water to every cell. New water heating system so we could get hot water to every cell, which every cell now has hot water. I mean, there was up, upper floors, you weren't getting hot water for a shower. Not good. We put in a water management system because inmates have a, uh, the detainees have, have, have a propensity uh, for putting things down in the toilet and, and, and uh, trying to clog it up and, and cause problems. So we've done two things. We put a water management system in so you can, you can flush the toilet once, you can flush the toilet twice, then you're locked out and for a while. And, and uh, so that's really helped the, 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 the abuses that's in place. We put in new sewage grinding systems so that we don't get backups from the sewer line uh, like we used to get. We put in a, a backup generator. We put in new air handling facilities, especially it was so important during COVID. The, the, the hot water and the water was really important during COVID, but also the air handling system. So it's filtered air, air that gets through it. Uh, the air handling system is being balanced. Um, we, the fire protection system is now alive. We have new locks and monitoring systems on the locks. We brought in a new food vendor. We brought in a new um, a commissary operator. We brought in a new food service operator. All that's been done uh, in less than two, two years. Uh, made a lot of improvements along those lines. We've, we, we've tried to establish policies and change our our philosophy with our staff, uh, that's a hard thing to do. We are understaffed and it's hard to staff at, at the Oklahoma County Detention Facility. Um, there are, we, you know, you can, you can you know, work at McDonald's or you can work at, at the detention facility for about the same amount of money. And it's, it's we don't always get, um, you know, sometimes people make, make choices to go, go elsewhere. Um, Department of Corrections, the State Department of Corrections just gave their detention officers, or correction officers, they call them, a 30% increase. So if you've got a choice of going to work at the state or the jail, where are you going to go? That's a problem for us, and that's going to have to be addressed. That's going to have to be addressed, Commissioner. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. As, as we go forward. Well, the fact of the matter is, it, it, it's, uh, if we can't get the staff, we're not able to provide the services we should be providing to the inmates. But. That being said, all those things have been done and the facility is better than it was two years ago. And we continue to make improvements to the facilities we go forward. We're not gonna put, you know, put a lot of money into it that's not, that's not needed. I think we could all agree that everything that we said was probably pretty much needed. So obviously money is an issue in trying to uh, hire talent. Are there any other barriers out there that are slowing you all down or maybe will prohibit you from some other improvements or some other things y'all would like to see done? Well, obviously money in all public facilities is an issue. Um, you know, we're doing things every day to improve things. I mean, this week it was a, a, a chiller in, in, in where, our, where our computer servers are that went out and we had to get a new chiller put in to, to, to take care of that. You're always going to be doing those type of things. But to make structural changes or, or facility changes to, to that jail, um, it would be expensive and, and uh, we'll probably be putting those type of improvements off uh, after the uh, successful elections <laughs> two weeks from yesterday. <laughs> uh, Commissioner, MAPS 4 has some criminal justice reform packages really in it, uh, diversion hub, mental health and addiction centers, etc. How will the new jail facility mesh with these and fit with these to improve our justice system? So MAPS 4 includes funding for the Diversion Hub, which if you don't know about the Diversion Hub, I would encourage you to go take a tour. Um, they are currently operating in a temporary spot at I think 10th and Robinson. Um, it, will, it has funding for new crisis centers, new mental health crisis centers, and a new rest, what we call a restoration center, which I was just talking with Mr. Kirkpatrick about this before. Um, the restoration center is based off of a facility in San Antonio that we took a group down to go tour and to go meet with their staff. And we felt like it was a very good fit for Oklahoma City. So our goal is that some of these facilities will be co-located ne very near the new jail. Um, so that law enforcement have easy access to all of these facilities and not just a jail. Um, that restoration center will include mental health crisis services, addiction treatment services. Uh, we would love for it to be a one-stop shop for all your crisis needs related to mental health and addiction. Um, so it's 
back to my very first question that I received, why now? We're, we're building this new facility alongside MAPS 4. And we're getting to see both of these large and public investments happen at the same time, and they're all addressing the same issues. All right, thank you. Uh, Sheriff, as we said earlier, it's gonna be a couple years before this facility gets built. So as a sheriff, what are, the, what are your current priorities um, as you continue the work on criminal justice reform? I believe it's, uh, you know, it's the village to keep the community safe and, and to offer um, resources to help people. So our big mission at the Sheriff's Office is understanding that we're the foundation, but we have to work with our diversionary partners. We have to work with DHS. We have to work with our mental health communities. You know, the establishment of our mental health response team has allowed us to be proactive to mental health instead of being very reactive to mental health. So I think from our end, it's just how can we exercise good ingenuity to continue the positive trajectory of, of the Sheriff's Office and for the community? Because once again, I, and I tell this to everybody who comes in, and I believe in it, there's no one person bigger than the office. There's no one person, including me, bigger than the mission and bigger than the community we serve. And so it's gonna all take us collectively to come together to make this go. Thanks. Um, Jim, back to you. Um, jail overcrowding has been a major issue um, just a few years ago, and a lot of work has been done in the interim to try to push those numbers down. But going forward, how, how do you see the, the courts and the court system working with diversion programs to really get residents in the jail the help that they need and continue to push that population down? Yeah, that's critical that, that, that we're going forward in that, in that direction. And uh, both municipal court, I see some municipal court people here today, and, and uh, the district courts have to work uh, toward that end. You know, public perception and criminal justice has changed over the last, it's, it's clearly, I mean, 30 years ago, it was tough on crime. That's what we need to do. And, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you do the crime, you gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta pay the price. And I think everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people understood, you know, that's not the right solution. We've gotta be able to, to, to rehabilitate people and yeah, pay the price, but get them the tools that they need to, to be successful. And so for the judges to understand that are, this person can be better off in a correctional facility, and sometimes that has to be the case, or are they better off getting put into a diversion hub or into a mental health facility or someplace to get them the help to correct their actions and give them the tools to be successful in life, I think is becoming much, much more understood and really needs to be the key as we go, go forward. So this is to all of you, but uh, Jim, you opened the, the door on this about talking about entire criminal justice reform, not just the jail facility. So beyond the jail facility and the challenges of it, what do each of you see as other sort of roadblocks that are slowing down our initiatives in criminal justice reform? Can you carry on, start with you. Can I say the state legislature? <laughs> I think you just did. <laughs> um, there are frequently bills that come before the state legislature every session that I think could lower our prison population, lower our jail population, and they just don't ever quite get the support that they need. Um, there's often bills that address our cash bail system. Uh, most of the folks sitting in our jail are lower income. They cannot afford to bond themselves out of jail. And there has been some pretty significant effort, I'm looking at uh, Senator Young, to, to fix that system. And it, it never, he's not part of the problem, he's part of the solution. <laughs> it, it never quite gets the support it needs. Um, so that, that state legislative body really needs to, um, if we're going to see some significant changes, it, a lot of it needs to happen there. Yep. Uh, two things come to mind. One, uh, by the way, Senator Young is part of the solution. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> that being said, Senator Young, funding for mental health from the state would be, would be very helpful as we go forward because uh, we have a high population of, of folks with, with different varying degrees of, of mental health issues and some solutions along that area, some resources toward that area would be very, very helpful. One of the other things I think we need to do is make sure that we're getting good coordination uh, between the jail and the district attorney's office and the judges. 
we seem to ha have a little bit of a, of a lapse there from time to time, and we'll have, I'll just give you an example. We get beat up because people die in the jail. Uh, some of those people that are dying in the jail are there because they've got some serious medical issues that were pre-existing before they came to the jail. We had a, a, a gentleman who was there, passed away earlier this year. I think he weighed about 400 pounds. He was on hospice. And, and he, you know, he was, he was going to die in, in the jail. There was no doubt about that. He, he, was, he, he had no court case scheduled. And he had some pretty serious sex crimes. But he was incapacitated. He was, he, he was unable to move. I mean, we, it, we spent a lot of money keeping him alive. And because of the severity of his crimes, they, 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 you know, he, was, he was deemed to be as, as, a, as incapacitated as he was. He was left in our custody and, and, until he died. And so we have a, another death in the jail because of a person that probably shouldn't have been in that jail. Sure. Um, I always talk about understanding. You know, I think we all have to come together and get a level of understanding of, you know, the problems the jail faces uh, and, and the situations that can be done to fix that. But the other thing I think, because I think going through tough times makes things, you know, you can't see it in the moment, but there's a, such a bright ending. And I think because of the tough times we have went through, there's a lot of bodies that have come together, mental health, diversionary. Um, you talk about the courts, you know, can we get a better understanding? Yes, but I think we have come together and we've worked together a lot more. I think more so now than we ever have in the past. And so, I. You know, I, I understand when people talk about roadblocks, but uh, I think the roadblock is understanding, but through that we've come together as a team and really have tried to approach this in, in a way to move us forward. Great. So again, uh, a question for all three of you. Um, we know everybody in here is gonna vote yes, so that's not the answer to the question I'm gonna ask you, but what can you challenge everybody in here to do, both as an individual and or an organization um, to, to move this initiative forward. Carrie? Make sure you have a plan to vote. Make sure you know where your precinct is. You might have a new precinct and a new voting location. Um, ask the folks who you live with what their plan to vote is. Uh, when someone verbally says their plan to vote, and are they gonna vote in person? Are they gonna vote absentee? Are they gonna vote early? Makes them a lot more likely to actually go vote. Um, and then any group you're a part of, Rotary, um, your church group, uh, your lunch group at work, have a conversation about, about this vote. Make sure they understand what they're voting on because there's some misinformation out there and encourage them to vote yes because we finally have an opportunity to fix this problem um, and, and this problem being the actual physical building while we are also working on criminal justice reform at the same time. Yep. You know, I, I think just more discussion on, on criminal justice reform and understanding all the organizations in the nonprofits that are involved in being an active part of the solution. And uh, I, I think it's, it's good to understand that there are a lot of people pulling on the rope on a, a rope in the same direction. Uh, for the last year or so at the Jail Trust, each month we had a nonprofit group that was doing some things associated in some way with, you know, from the Homeless Alliance to, to TEAM and, and, and the Diversion Hub and, and Reemerge. And there's a whole bunch of groups out there. And we had them all come in. And, you know, I'm a, I know a little bit about this just because I've, I was city manager for, you know, for a long time. I, I, I should know some of these things. I didn't know a lot. <laughs> there was a lot that I didn't know out there. I learned every, every, every month somebody would come in and I'd go, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that was going on. There's a lot of people doing a lot of good things in this, in, in this area, and we need more resources to make those things happen. Sure. I think this has to be a, a grassroots campaign, and we, each person is responsible to tell another person to vote yes on June 28th, because it's just a ripple effect that occurs from that, because there's people that value you all's opinion, and you know, that is what we need to be successful in this. I will tell you, I believe this is one thing that everyone collectively agrees on, but it still is worth saying and it still is worth promoting. Thank you. So I'm not supposed to comment on this, I'm just the moderator, but Jim kind of opened the door a little bit and that is most people don't understand the complexity of the criminal justice system. 
in the fact that no one is in charge of it. Nobody has the job of I control the criminal justice system. Jim alluded to nonprofits, there's law enforcement, there's judges, there's prosecutors, there's public defenders, on and on and on. But no one sits at the top of that pyramid, nobody. And so the points that were made about bringing everybody to the table uh, and getting everybody to buy in is what has been the real challenge because everybody's kind of used to working in their silo and never knowing that unintended consequences occur when they change policies. Yeah. Uh, and those unintended consequences can really derail the effort for criminal justice reform. So just wanted to add that on to it. So uh, it's time now for y'all. Uh, we're going to move into... Um, the audience and any questions that y'all have and you can direct it to whoever you want up here and staff has a mic so if you'll just raise your hand um, they will bring it to you while we're waiting on a question it, the the description the job description you g just gave sounds like mr tardy bono's job description <laughs> well he's not in charge but he sure works hard <laughs> Hi, um, you guys mentioned a lot about mental health and how the new jail will help facilitate some of that. How does that go in with the plan of MAPS 4 and the mental health facilities with that plan? So currently in the jail, and I'll let you jump in on this too, we have one medical provider, Turnkey Health, and they provide their, as part of their contract, they provide mental health services. Now, I don't know if in the new facility we will have two separate contracts for mental health services and traditional health services. I'm not sure. That could be an option. Those MAPS facilities, I, I envision them to be co-located but not necessarily inside the jail because folks inside the jail need treatment and services and folks outside the jail need treatment and services. So. I would love that. So she said, do you think people will be referred into those facilities? Um, law enforcement can bring them there. Um, yes, I would love that. Yeah. The thing is, especially with mental health and what the public, general public doesn't understand, law enforcement officers don't just take someone in a manic mental health crisis right. to the county jail. There has been probable cause and an arrest that was made. And it's not the officer's duty, even though we are responsible and asked to be proficient in so many dif disciplines, I don't believe it's the officer's duty to go and determine if this person committed a crime because they were manic. But I believe, and this is where the marriage comes in and where it works, is when that officer introduces them into the jail, now we have professionals that can say, hey, you committed a thing, yes, but was it because you were in a poor mental health state? So you may not need to go into the jail facility. We need to route you to this facility. And that's where the care comes in. And that's, where I, that's how I believe it all comes together. Just like to add a little bit to that. And, you know, when MAPS 4 was passed, the jail was going to stay there. And now we've got a changing condition. And so I'm convinced that smart people will take this new changing condition and leverage it so it will be a better facility. David Todd's the MAPS director sitting over there at that table. And David has been able to in the city, I think it's done a good job of that, being, being responsive to changes in needs, because MAPS is a long-term project. And yeah. what was originally envisioned with MAPS when the vote was passed didn't always end up that way. But in my opinion, it was almost always for the better. And I, I think this will happen too. Don't know the answer to it quite yet, but I, it's an opportunity to, to, to have a better solution than we had before. So you all continue to kind of talk about the possibility of reducing it from a 13-story location to a one-story, and I would envision it's going to have to be a pretty large facility. Have you identified potential locations in which this would be located? And I would envision it's going to have to be a pretty large section of land just because of where you would yeah. need it to be and co-locating other things around it. So not asking you to, like, disclose that, but just... <laughs> 
<laughs> whether or not you've identified things and we, what, we, you're ha what you have in mind. We'd be happy to disclose it if there was anything to disclose. <laughs> and there isn't. And, and I'm going to go back to MAPS for a minute because when MAPS was passed, we didn't know where, where the arena was going to go. We didn't know where the canal was going to go. We didn't know where the ballpark was going to go originally. And, 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 and you don't really want to, you, you want to take your time and, and, and do it strategically. It's going to have to be, yes, a larger tract of land than we have to have today. But it has to be somewhat um, close to downtown because of the interaction between the, the courthouse and such, and it's got to have some ease. It's got to be you know, relatively close, which is downtown, to the police headquarters to make sure that the police, because Oklahoma City is not the only user of the, of the facility, outside the sheriff's office, obviously, but it, it's a major user of the facility. And so we've got to take all those things in, in, into consideration. So no, we don't know where it's going to go. Two, it's going to be a bigger tract, and it's going to have to have some relationship to downtown. I'm looking at her. She, I, yeah. I agree with all of that. <laughs> well, I would add to that, too. You know, the ideal site would be publicly owned already. Yeah. That way, the cost of the land acquisition would be smaller. Because that, you know, if, if it's privately owned, whoever owns it is going to want some money for it. And that's going to run up the cost of the facility. So in a perfect world, it's out there somewhere. But we don't live in a perfect world. Yeah. <laughs> This one said two for. Um, can the ARPA funds be utilized to pay for the health and mental health portions of the project? And is it your intention that the restoration center would be in close proximity to the new jail, like just like in San Antonio? So maybe not a sep maybe not the same building, but at least in the same vicinity. Yeah. Is that? Yes. I would love for it to be in the same area. Yes, I think that's our hope. Um, what, refresh my memory on your first question. ARPA funds for the okay. health and mental health portions. So Mr. Couch talked about this. When we first received our ARPA funds, it was kind of the general discussion of, hey, this is a lot of money we can use toward the new jail. And then the treasury came out with their final guidance to all the communities who received ARPA funds. And it was pretty clear that you cannot use ARPA funds directly toward a new detention center. So I, I think to answer your question, I think my opinion is no, we can't um, take direct ARPA funds and use it directly toward the jail. Um, but there are ways that you can use ARPA funds to pay for things within county government that may free up some of our existing funds. That's an option. Um, but to use ARPA money straight towards a new detention center, it was made pretty clear that we're not supposed to do that. The, this question's for the sheriff. Uh, I was just curious, I, the jail isn't designed to be a long-term incarceration point for a detainee. What is the average time that a detainee is held at the current facility and moving to the new facility, assuming it's going to be built, how will that change things? Well, uh, I don't run or operate the jail. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and and, and that, that's, that's not a knock. A lot of people don't understand the jail was taken away from the sheriff under P.D. Taylor in June 2020, I believe. And so right now, um, I guess my limited knowledge is just what I have, but people are spending an extended period of time there, and you know, like I said, it's just the case load that everyone at the county is dealing with. I believe that directly affects you know how people are seen and how that's processed through. And you would hope that this new jail facility um, would speed things up. If I could add to that, I'm not. I don't know if, the, if, the, if a different facility will speed up the judicial process. The judicial, the answer to your, of how long are they staying there is too long. And, and I don't know uh, that a new facility will, will directly affect that, but that's what CJAC is doing with Tim Tarboni and, 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 and uh, Roy Williams and other others is, is, is looking at that, whatever we can do in the, in the criminal justice system to, to improve those things. And part of that has to be judicial process. And so we, we, we have looked at that. Uh, it's not easy. We need to continue to, to, to look at that. Um, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier some issues, you know, if we can get a smoother running operation between the public defender, the district attorney, and, 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 and the judges, um, that I think, 
this is not my area of expertise. I think there's opportunities out there, and I believe there's opportunities out there because it's been done better elsewhere. I would just add, too, when, when we got into this six years ago and looked at who was in the jail back then, 80% um, of the people had not been convicted of a crime, which means they didn't have their day in court. And, you know, until you fix that, it's kind of hard to answer that question. And, and Timothy, I'll put you on the spot. Do we have any kind of numbers or statistics as it relates to what the average stay is in the jail today? How long these days of duration? How long they're still there? And it's a, a day of duration. As far as we don't, we don't know that they haven't been let out yet. 120 days, about average. But but we have a serious you know, high level violent crimes that have been there more than a year, more than 18 months, more than two years. And so it's not just the front end, the diversion side, it's also the back end, people that don't need to be released, um, that those cases need to be processed as well. And I'll kind of put in a plug for our public defender's office. Uh, they're pretty underfunded. Most public defenders have a caseload double what the American Bar Association recommends. So it's hard for those public defenders to really spend the time on these cases that they deserve. And that's not the only problem to folks sitting there. It's, it's the entire case processing system and the entire judicial system. But I do want to speak up for our public defenders that are trying their best to represent all those people in the jail who need representation, but their caseloads are pretty high. Once this does pass, um, what's the projected timeline that we that you're thinking that it may take to build? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. The commissioners have not had a public discussion about what our anticipated timeline is. I know we'd like to start forming that citizens advisory board pretty quickly and getting that off the ground and then figuring out where it's going to be and figuring out who is going to design it. Those will be our first big steps and then we can figure out what our timeline is. Yeah, uh, a site would be good too. Yeah, a location, a site, yeah. yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and once those things are done, you're, and once you've got a design professional on board, you're probably talking a year to eight, 18 months for design and a minimum of two years for construction. So, um, I think the main thing that I would like to say is just thank you. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Um, this is not an easy uh, task, and it is absolutely, I've not talked to a single person who doesn't see the need for a new jail, a new facility, a, a facility that reflects restorative justice and allows a person to be treated like a person. Um, and I think this is a very obvious step in the, in, in the next step in creating a justice system that seeks to heal and not harm. Um, but I just want to reiterate, because I think the, the, the and you guys have said this so uh, well and, and eloquently, but um, I'm a big believer as I look at Randy Tate across the room who taught me this, people who battle mental illness or addiction ought to be treated as patients, not prisoners. And the fact that we have MAPS-4 uh, coming that would increase access to mental health services in our community gives us the opportunity. Sheriff Johnson, the, the fact that we have a focus on law enforcement getting the training they need so that when a person is in crisis, they can take them to the appropriate setting is so incredibly important. And, and um, I just want to say thank you, but also reiterate the, the opportunity to not only move in a direction, and, and you know, the current facility was built as a maximum security facility. So literally, regardless if you're, you're apprehended for a low level offense or if it is something serious, you're kind of put in a situation that just increases the trauma uh, in your life. And that's, that's not a correctional situation that that tends to drive a person deeper into the um, it, it at least in, increase the criminogenic risk factors in their life but having a facility that allows us to treat people with dignity and respect 
and value and begin that process of really uh, correcting and improving uh, not only allows us to be more humane, I think it is absolutely good for public safety uh, in our community. So again, I, I guess I don't even have a question other than <laughs> you agree. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I really want to echo Chris's statement um, and, and sentiments as a, a community activist, strong leftist, and somebody um, who the vulnerable and marginalized in our, in our society is near and dear to my heart, um, and somebody who our current district attorney has had a fixation with incarcerating, and so I've spent several nights in the jail and am intimately familiar with um, that dungeon. Um, I am uplifted in to be in a room, the chamber, on many issues, uh, among people with many issues I strongly disagree. Um, but I want to express my commitment, and I know those involved in my work and, and in the work, of building bridges and working together to continue the improvement and the support and building and giving in to the people who need our help in this community. And we all know that most of those people in the county jail are just those people. Um, and so I, I'm, I was nervous this year as we've seen a wave of the reemergence of tough on crime uh, sweep into the political forces that people would get wet feet. Um, so I'm very um, uplifted and optimistic that this community, this group has remained committed to this cause of resolving this ongoing injustice. I applaud you for that. And I think that lastly, I just want to say and add to what Chris has said is that, and I'm, I'm reminded sitting here next to my dear friend, Pastor Scobie of Ebenezer Baptist Church, who preaches the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of love. And little in there is about punishment. And justice truly isn't about punishment. It's about restoration, restoration of the victim, restoration of the offender. My parents were death penalty uh, defense attorneys my, most of my life, and so I know that hurt people hurt people. But if we as a community, and we have this collective power to intervene into those lives, the offender and the victim, and heal both, then our society is really moving somewhere. And I am committed to that, and I think our entire community is committed to that. And I really don't have much patience for the marginalized few who aren't. Thank you. So I'm a little bit new to this. So, um, <laughs> uh, but but Jim, um, talk about a new facility. You talked about staffing is one of the most critical issues. Have you all thought about what would a new facility do to your ability to recruit and retain uh, professionals to serve in that f new, better designed facility? Uh, obviously, we'd be very positive in our recruiting efforts. I mean, if you have a chance to go to a new facility where we're able to you know, have pods with minimum security folks and, and, and just a, a better environment, a little more sunlight would be good. You know, there, there's, a, yeah, there's, there, there's a lot of challenges within it. So it, it would help immensely in our recruiting, I'm sure. Hi, I'm a recent transplant from Denver, Colorado, and I would like to say I'm very impressed with the panelists in this whole presentation today. It's very informative. I am an Oklahoma County resident, so you definitely have my vote but uh, they had a great program in Denver that was implemented by Mayor Hancock where they actually had uh, professional counselors that rode along on calls that were specifically related to mental illness. So basically having an interven intervention before somebody ended up in jail. And is there any thought or have you looked into that type of program for specifically for Oklahoma City? Connie, can you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> this is Connie Schlittler with North Care. Uh, we have talked to Chief Gorley about that for Oklahoma City. We do have two workers currently with uh, Edmond Police Department 
who are do ride-alongs and deal with human service issues that are happening in Edmond. So I think it's a matter of staffing and finding some additional staff because Chief Gorley said, give me five right now. He would love to have that. But we're working on uh, mobile crisis teams and different models. Obviously, the co-responder model is what you're talking about. And there's also encouragement in the community to have models where the police do not have to be involved in the calls, which is what the Denver Star has done. And I appreciate Jess, because he and others had introduced us to the Denver Star program. So really, right now, we're working on both tracks, ways we can intervene without the police ever having to go out, and then also having folks that do ride-alongs with the police. So we're really early on, but I'm glad we have support for that. That's great. Thank you. I would also add too, there, I don't know what the number is, maybe uh, Timothy knows, the number of police departments that are in Oklahoma County. Mm -hmm. So, you know, each one has their own procedures, their own policies, their own initiatives. By far, Oklahoma City is the largest provider of inmates in it, uh, but yet there are other cities, many cities, that still have to look at their policies and their procedures too, you know, not just one uh, police department. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, we're right on time, so uh, let's give the panelists another round of applause. Thank you. Robin. Thank you. Again, I want to thank Cox Business um, and uh, corporate sponsor ADG for being a uh, presenting sponsor here and a corporate sponsor. So I hope all of you will join us next month at the Chamber Forum. That's on July 20th, where we will hear more about the progress that's happening with Convergence and the Innovation District, including the MAPS 4 projects that will increase opportunities for entrepreneurs. Additionally, save the date for our annual State of the City luncheon on July 14th, featuring Mayor Holt, and the annual State of the Schools luncheon on August the 10th. You can purchase your tickets for all these events at okcchamber.com. So thank all of you for being here, and we are adjourned. Thank you.